see how this works. Open chat. There we go. All right. I think I am live. And I have a reminder up. There we go. I am live. Hopefully people can hear. Yep. I have the audio coming through. So we are live on YouTube. I don't know that we are quite live yet on LinkedIn or Twitter. So if anybody is here. All right. There we go. Live on Twitter. I see that. Live on LinkedIn. Maybe. Um, since it's not quite 11, I don't know that LinkedIn lets me go live. So we're just going to hang out, make sure LinkedIn goes live. Uh, if you are here watching and want to comment, I think I have a way to see all of the comments now, uh, between all the different platforms cause I'm trying to go live. So this is the first time I'm doing these office hours, Q and a, if you're watching, uh, all around Microsoft 365 admin. So I will start off. I have a little bit of news that we can talk through. I have kind of a quick, uh, tip or a quick demo. Um, I see at least one person I think is on, um, and then questions. So if you do have questions and you want to throw them in the chat, I should see them. Um, again, this is the first time, so I'm trying to balance everything out. Uh, I don't know if LinkedIn went live, but I am just going to dive in. LinkedIn says it is pre-live. Oh, there we go. I see you. Good morning. Uh, so I am seeing the chats here. Uh, so diving in, this is going to be April 2024. My goal is to actually do this, um, on a monthly basis. I don't know that I can quite handle this doing it more than monthly. Uh, so for those of you that are tuning in, if you don't know who I am, you haven't met me before. You just kind of stumbled across this today. Uh, my name is Ben Stedjink. I'm a Microsoft 365 admin consultant and trainer. So do a bunch of teaching, do a bunch of consulting as well. Uh, my website is here on the slide, intellijink.com. Um, I also host a podcast that we release bi-weekly now, the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, uh, msclouditpro.com, if you want to go check out that. And that's something new. If you're looking to become the go-to Microsoft 365 expert at your company, for your clients, uh, let me know. I would love to hear from you, see how I can work with you to help you become that go-to Microsoft 365 expert. So that link is intelligink.com slash m365expert. Fill out the form. Uh, I'll reach out and uh, get in touch with you. Uh, so diving into just some news from this past month. So there's lots of Microsoft 365 news that comes out. My goal is not to spend a ton of time just sitting here and talking through the news, but I did want to highlight a couple of news items um, that have come out. I kind of went back the last couple weeks or so. Uh, the first one, this is an important one, especially if you're an admin and you like PowerShell, is that on March 30 of 2024, so about uh, two weeks ago now, two and a half weeks ago, uh, both the Microsoft Online or MSOL and the Azure AD PowerShell modules for uh, Azure AD, primarily Microsoft Online, were deprecated. Uh, Microsoft has said they'll continue to allow these modules to work for a minimum of six months before retirement. So MSOL, Azure AD, it's not going to break today. Uh, it's still going to work for you if you still have scripts running in it. They should work for at least the next six months. Uh, certain things may start breaking, I would say, over time. Uh, there's not going to be any more updates to it, uh, anything like that. Um, I do have these links, too, in the chat. I did think about this ahead of time. So if you do want to go check out these links, I will throw these out there. 
Uh, but as you are thinking through PowerShell modules, what you have out there, whether this is running in uh, Azure Automation, if this is running in scheduled jobs on your machine, uh, you're going to want to start converting those over to Microsoft Graph PowerShell. Uh, this is the future of Microsoft 365, uh, PowerShell, Azure AD PowerShell. Uh, the website, the first one I linked to there and the one that I put out in the chat, I'll... Um, yeah, those will all be out there. So that gives you a good command lit mapping too. It gives you a little bit of a how to get started with Microsoft Graph PowerShell if you haven't played with it yet. Uh, it also gives you a command lit mapping. So this was the command in uh, MSOL, Microsoft Online PowerShell, or this was the command in Azure AD. Here's the new command lit when it comes to Microsoft Graph. So hopefully that can help you as you convert all of those scripts over. Uh, from the older module to the newer module. Um, so something to be aware of. Uh, absolutely get those scripts converted over. The next one, the new Planner app. Uh, this is what I've actually been playing with. I, I'll be honest, I haven't used Planner a lot in the past. Uh, with some of the new stuff they're coming out with, with the new Planner app, I've started playing with this a little bit more, testing it out. Uh, this is only in Teams for now. So the new Planner app is out rolling out in Teams. If you want to go try out the new Planner app, uh, you're going to have to do it in Teams for the time being. Uh, this will come out to the web and to uh, Microsoft Project, actually, later this year. Uh, and part of this is uh, an initiative to kind of bring some of these task management apps, uh, bring Project and uh, Planner together. Um, and uh, you're starting to see like to do and planner work a little bit closer together. This is going to start bringing planner and project closer together. And you start seeing that in even some of these other announcements about uh, like planner premium. Uh, so planner premium is uh, coming out as well. And this is going to, excuse me, I think I'm going to sneeze. Maybe not. Um, Planner Premium is going to bring additional functionality to Planner. Uh, it's going to bring things like a timeline or a Gantt chart view, dependencies between tasks, sprints, custom fields, uh, team workloads, managing goals, and other types of functionality uh, to the Planner platform. But the interesting thing about this is now if you go to Planner and you have the option to either buy or try uh, Planner Premium. Uh, it's actually just a rename of Project Plan 1. So this is where you start to see as well some of those things coming together in terms of uh, Project and Planner maybe merging. Uh, project Plan 3 and Plan 5 are going to stay the same, so there is still going to be that differentiation between those higher levels of project uh, Maybe it'll change down the road. We'll just have to see. But there is some investment in Planner, and this has been an interesting to, thing to watch. Over the last couple of years, I feel like Planner uh, maybe even stagnated a little bit. There wasn't as much attention uh, given to it. Uh, I've started to feel the beginning of 2024 that Planner has uh, kind of got new legs, some new life. Microsoft's starting to put a little bit more work into Planner. So... If you haven't used it, you want to go check it out. Uh, maybe play with Planner Premium, or if you already have Project Plan 1, you can start playing with Planner Premium as well. Uh, another news article uh, related to Teams and Teams phone calling and call record insights. Uh, this one is only applicable if you're doing stuff with Microsoft Teams calling, uh, but clients that I have worked with, people that I've talked to that do use Teams calling, especially in larger environments, uh, do care about some of the reporting uh, that you can get out of phone calls through Microsoft Teams. And uh, it hasn't been great. 
Microsoft says right in the blog post here that uh, the team's phone calling reports haven't been great. They haven't been the easiest to work with in the past. Uh, I've worked with them. I've tried to pull reports into Power BI uh, and work with these various reports, and it wasn't fun. Uh, Microsoft recently announced, and I think this was in the last week or so, Call Record Insights, uh, which will hopefully simplify this uh, as you start working with calls and pulling some of that data out. So this isn't necessarily a feature or functionality that you go turn on. Uh, you'll see the deployment guide on here. It's linked to in the blog post as well. Uh, where it actually goes and creates some infrastructure within Azure. Uh, it uses Azure functions, storage queues, event hubs, and puts a bunch of the data into Cosmos uh, DB and integrates this all so you can start pulling this data in uh, Data Explorer. Uh, so there will be some cost with this because you are going to be spinning up those different resources in your Azure environment. But this is going to go ahead and as those call record details uh, become available, it's going to automatically fetch a lot of those records from within the data that's generated with these phone calls. Uh, the nice thing is, is it's going to actually take a bunch of that data, convert it all from the JSON data to tables. So it's easier to work with. You're not going to have to worry about code. You're not going to have to worry about... Uh, any crazy configurations with that, um, you'll just deploy those resources through that GitHub link. Once it's there, you can start using Data Explorer and do things like write KQL, write KQL queries uh, against your data. You can uh, build Custo dashboards leveraging those queries. So this is going to enable you to have a lot richer functionality uh, and hopefully a lot easier functionality. When you're trying to pull those details about call records out, uh, you can hook this right into Power BI as well. So again, I've looked at the Power BI data in the past, uh, kind of the data that you could pull out before. It wasn't necessarily easy to work with. Uh, so I have not spun this up yet. Again, I just saw it in the last few days. I plan to go turn this on, spin one of these up and play with it. Maybe we'll do a future one of these where I'll demo this once it's all set up uh, and dive into it a little bit more. Uh, so if you're doing call calls, you want to pull more insights, have more functionality and uh, ability to look at those different insights, uh, absolutely go check this out. Go ahead and try to deploy it. Uh, again, be aware that there's going to be a cost with it. Uh, next up is a new feature to Microsoft Defender. So diving into security a little bit more. Uh, QR code threats have become increasingly popular with, uh, I think people have just developed a habit of someone pops up a QR code and you scan it or somebody uh, signs have QR codes on them. Uh, QR codes are popping up all over the place. It's funny because they've been around for so long um, but I feel like they've started gaining popularity recently. And a common attack is people are actually maybe putting a sticker of a malicious QR code over a legitimate one. Uh, different ways to try to exploit QR codes, especially because with QR codes, uh, before you scan it, you don't know what the URL is. You don't know where that QR code is going to take you. Uh, what that QR code may link to. So within Microsoft Defender, Microsoft has now rolled out uh, the ability for Defender to extract URLs from these QR codes. Uh, this may not necessarily prevent your users from scanning them, uh, but it will help you as a security expert go in and detect when a malicious QR code has been scanned. Uh, because what Defender will do now is it'll extract that URL from the QR code. And within your logs, within Microsoft Defender, within Sentinel, you can see within Advanced Hunting, wherever you're looking at those logs, the source or location is going to be identified as a QR code. 
Uh, so if you're going into Security Center in Microsoft 365, going through Explorer, you can actually go in and start doing a source filter now on where are these links, where the source URL, URL includes a QR code, uh, set up different detection rules and alerting uh, through advanced hunting, through some of these sample queries and detection rules that are available here, uh, so that you can detect if people are scanning QR codes and visiting a URL uh, after scanning those QR codes, or if you're having uh, an abundance of people within your organization scanning QR codes, maybe you want to do some security training around some of the risks with uh, QR codes. So this another nice feature added to Microsoft Defender. If you are worried about QR codes and you want to go in and do a little investigating or hunting within your logs uh, to uh, see how are QR codes or how are you users scanning QR codes, what types of URLs are they visiting uh, by scanning those QR codes. So that kind of wraps up some of the news for this month. Again, there was a lot more there. I wanted to pick and choose. I didn't want this to just be, here's a bunch of news. Um, I wanted to try to mix this up a little bit. So moving on to our Microsoft 365 tip for this month. Uh, this is one that came from some interactions I had with a client. Uh, they had a question about this. And as I dove more into it, actually preparing for today, I learned some new stuff about uh, this particular tip and trick that I'm going to share with you. So it's related to Microsoft audit logs and mailbox auditing. Uh, and we'll kind of talk through this. And then I'm going to go in and demo this, show you some of how this works. And some of the interesting things about this that, to be honest, I'm not 100% I'm not sure I like how this is done. I might be nice to see Microsoft change some of this. But to start with the Microsoft 365 audit log, uh, if you aren't familiar with it, as an admin, this is something you should absolutely know about. Uh, the Microsoft 365 audit log is available in both the Compliance Center and in the Admin Center in Microsoft 365, and logs pretty much every activity that exists within Microsoft 365. Uh, I went through the website that lists them all and counted, a, it was a couple months back now. I want to say it's up around 381, 382 activities, uh, if not a few more, that are logged within the Microsoft 365 audit log. Uh, this audit log, it does change a little bit based on what licenses you have. You get a lot of them with just every license. There is a premium license that gives you a little bit more functionality. Uh, but what we were particularly interested in and what this tip is going to revolve around is audit logging of mailboxes, uh, in particular owner activities on a mailbox. Uh, so if you go out to, oh, we jumped over to the QA already. I'm going to, all right, I'm going to play that. And I messed up my whole deck now because I hit the wrong button. I want to go over. Okay, forget it. We're going to do this a different way. This is what happens when you do these things live. I lost my Windows 11 window. Here we go. The audit log. Uh, and in particular, that link that we were looking at when it comes to the audit log, and I'm going to grab it. I didn't preload that one here. Uh, manage mailbox audit logging. So if you go look through the manage mailbox audit logging, there are a few things you need to do when you're enabling this. Um, most of the time, it is enabled already now, but you are going to want to go in and check, and I'll show you how this works, to make sure that audit logging is enabled for mailboxes. But there are different actions that are audited based on if you're an admin, if you're a delegate on a mailbox, or if you're the owner of a mailbox. And one of those, the one that came into question was actually this send functionality, 
where you can see this is enabled for owners and this is interesting. It says owners and admins. It is audited. It is not on though by default. Uh, this is also one that is part of the purview audit premium. So this is an additional license to audit sending. And you'll see some of those in here where it's search query is premium, send is premium. Uh, and there's a couple others uh, that are in here. So this is for user mailboxes and shared mailboxes. If you get down into Microsoft 365 group mailboxes, uh, certain actions are uh, audited differently. Uh, when it comes to group mailboxes. So really when it comes to Exchange, auditing Exchange is uh, a little different I've found than everything else. Um, so the first thing, what you're gonna wanna do if you are curious in auditing these and what we were playing with is you're gonna go into PowerShell and if you haven't installed the Exchange Online Management shell, uh, you're absolutely going to want to go and install that. Uh, it's just going to be install module exchange online management. I've already installed it in my environment here. So I'm going to bypass that. And then once it's installed, you can type in connect dash exchange online. And this will go out and connect to your exchange online environment. Uh, it's going to pop up my environment, log me in. All my credentials were saved in this Windows session and log into my Exchange online environment. The first thing, if this is not on, and this might be something you just want to check initially for all of your users, is are my users' mailboxes actually enabled for auditing? And are they being logged? So it's just to get mailbox identity and identity, and then type in their email address. Uh, this will go in, you can see it's admin delegate audit log is set. Uh, if I wanted to go in and, um, yeah, it'll go in, see which actions are being logged. It's admin and audit. You'll notice the owner ones in this one, uh, sorry, going up here, admin and delegate are being logged. Owner is not being logged. And that goes into that. A uh, second, I can't remember if it's further down in, I think it's further down here. Um, that owner mailboxes or owner actions on a mailbox aren't logged by default. Uh, it is get mailbox, audit owner, display, does not this link. I need to go find my other link that I had this up on. Uh, do, 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 do this one, not that one, this one. It's under the troubleshooting audit logs. So let me drop this one in. Uh, right here, by default, only non-owner mailbox audit logging is enabled and owner audit mailbox log is disabled. If you have to perform owner mailbox audit logging to investigate a specific issue, you can temporarily enable the process. Here it says for a two week period, what I haven't tested out yet is, is this two week period, uh, does Microsoft automatically turn it off after two weeks or is it a recommendation? Because in other places they say it's recommended to only keep it on for two weeks. The reason being, and this is the one I don't know 100% what the reasoning is for this, these audit logs are actually stored in the user's mailbox. They're not stored in another location. Um, so when this is on, uh, it's possible to actually, and I think they're stored in the deleted items folder, like that hidden deleted items folder, not the mailbox. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, this is where it said for a limited period, approximately two weeks. It's because the audit log entries are stored in the mailbox and it may cause the mailbox dumpster, which is the deleted items, to exceed the size limit. So if you're gonna turn this on, um, you have to be aware of that. Uh, so this is another PowerShell script we wanted to go look at. So for mine, let's go in, make sure uh, my auditing is enabled. So this is how you can check if auditing is indeed enabled for the mailbox. 
for mine. It's true. Uh, but then if you want to audit those activities, you actually need to go in and set mailbox and set the user identity and set that audit enabled to true. Mine is off right now. Um, so I could go in and type this on, audit enabled, set it to true. Uh, and this would go enable it. So we already did that. Mine was true. I don't need to worry about that step for my mailbox. I think I misspoke there. That is, if that came back as false, you'd want to run this. Now, if you want to go enable the owner audit logging, there's a separate commandlet to go set the mailbox and set the audit owner and then what you actually want to audit uh, for those owner activities. So this would go in and say, I want to audit as the owner of my own mailbox when I create something, hard delete, move, move to deleted item, soft delete, update. Uh, these all come from this other link that I had. Let's jump back here. Uh, when we went down here and looked at this, this is going to be the hard delete, the create, uh, and the send. And in the particular case when we were going through this, we were curious about auditing all the send commands on a mailbox. So if you wanted to audit those, you would uh, jump forward to this. Let's go grab this commandlet and we'll paste it in here. You would have to add send. So the sample that Microsoft gives doesn't have send on there by default. Go in here, we can set the mailbox and we're gonna go enable this for my mailbox now. So this goes in now and actually starts auditing all those activities for my mailbox when I'm performing them as the owner. So if I was to go look at this table now, we'll see how, oh, not that one, other one. Wanted to go up a couple. Uh, default audit set. I wasn't sure if that would come back with owner yet or not. I didn't test that out. Testing stuff live. Um, but that's gonna show, uh, this is gonna start enabling those activities now for that particular, or for my mailbox. Um, so now if I want to go in and actually start auditing these, I can use PowerShell to do the whole search thing. But now if I go back to my audit log, so I'm back in my compliance center, you'll see I ran a couple searches already. Um, what we could do, and I can show this. So I turned this on once on the 4th. I turned it off again on the 11th. Um, so I did not audit any of my own send activities before the 1st. So if I was to go in here and say, I want to search for anything in my audit log from like the 1st of March to the 1st of April. And for my particular user, so I'm going to go pick my user, activities to search for. And these are those 380 some odd activities you can audit. The one we're interested in is sent messages. Uh, so I can go in. So now I'm looking for March 1 to April 1, any messages that were sent by me. I'm going to go in and trigger a search for that. We'll see how long this takes to complete. It'll pop up down here. It queues it up and go runs the search. You can see some of these do take four or five minutes to run. Uh, on the flip side, if I'm going to go in and... Uh, run another one, and we may just go in and look at this one. I ran this one from April 1 to April 12. Same thing, my mailbox looking for sent messages here. If I go open this up, you will see an audit log of all of those mailboxes or all of those sent messages. In theory, there it goes. Uh, I shouldn't have clicked refresh. Should have known better. Just wait. Um, you'll see a list of all the messages that I've sent over a period of time, and you'll see that it cuts off at April 11. It hasn't picked up any emails that I sent uh, actually late last night, or early today. And if I go back, even though I set it to start on the 1st, I don't have a single message before April 4 um, when I turn this on. So the one downside of this, and I, I, I sort of get why it's done, uh, maybe not fully, is that if auditing is not enabled for the owner, 
you can't go back and historically search, at least in the audit log, for sent messages. Um, this is only turn it on. When you turn it on, it starts auditing. Microsoft recommends don't leave this on for more than two hours or two weeks. Uh, so if you want to go like four or five weeks, you may have issues. Um, now, there are other ways you can see what people have sent. Uh, you still have e-discovery to look at sent messages. You can do uh, legal holds. You can do retention. Uh, a lot of those other things, but you're not going to have the audit logging. Um, I'm not going to go in and click on actually one of those items. It does show you like who I sent it to, what the subject of the email was, all of that. So I'll keep that a little private. Um, but that is how the audit logging works. Again, a little bizarre. It raised some questions because I have clients that have gone out and paid for the E5. They have the premium and they're like, why am I searching for the audit log? Or why am I searching for sent messages? And I'm getting zero results. Uh, as you'll see, I'm going to go refresh this. We'll see if it's finished yet. Um, it hasn't. But you'll see this has been running for two minutes. It has zero results. This will come back with zero results for that time frame because auditing wasn't on. Uh, so it raised a lot of questions and confusions. Originally, when I was testing this, I thought it would go back in time. And it was just that it wasn't showing the audit log. It's that these activities are not actually saved because of that location uh, where they're saved. So once you're done doing that, doing that investigation, you can go set the audit owner here to none um, instead of all these activities. And that will go in, turn it off so you don't fill up your deleted items in your mailbox. Uh, but then you won't also return any of those sent items anymore uh, in your audit log. So a little odd, but also something good to know if you are wanting to search for those sent messages or have those audited for a period of time. Um, I don't have any other explanation. The only re thing I can think of is why Microsoft might do this is it does look at like the admin and the delegate. Um, some of those other things, because typically when a mailbox is compromised, stuff is getting sent as the app or there's other activities going on. And there are also other protections in Exchange Online where if a mailbox is compromised and it's sending out a bunch of bulk emails, uh, like your outgoing spam protection and some of that will catch it. Or if you have rules around mail forwarding rules getting set up, um, this is... I don't know if it's geared more for if you have third-party applications that are tied into your environment that are sending out messages. Uh, those types of things will be audited kind of under that uh, delegate set. Um, it's it's an interesting scenario, but again, something to be aware of. So uh, with that, I see, uh, I see a couple of people. I see Andrew and Sean both in the chat. And... Andrew said he has questions uh, locked and loaded. So I will say with that, uh, does anybody have any questions about the tips or tricks um, that we went over? Questions about um, really anything Microsoft 365 related. I have the next 30 minutes kind of set aside to just hang out and answer any questions that you may have. And I am going to break my own rule and do this because I messed up my presentation in terms of which monitor it's on. So if you do want to go download the deck, there is a link here if you want to do that to get some of the links. Um, I have a newsletter. Go sign up for the newsletter. If you want to find me and ask questions not on this, just go search for Ben Stedging. Uh, I own the first page of results because there are no other Ben Stedgings. Uh, so with that, questions. Andrew, my big question with a smiley face. That should that worry me that I see um a big question. Okay, historically, I've only had people in my org use my Microsoft 365 investments. I recently had a bunch of externals join the team for classes, meetings. Um so I'm guessing that's like well, this just keeps going, Andrew. Um 
like guest accounts that are listed in your tenant. Contractor has their own account in their tenant that's not external. So a mix of guest users and licensed users. What do those externals have access to or the contractor have access to? What people have access to? Um, okay, so what externals have access to? Uh, whatever you gave them access to. How's that for a horrible answer? Um, there are ways with licensing to go in and do access reviews that will go in and look at um, where there's guests added. I'm trying to think through. I'm just going to go over to the admin center. Let's jump over here. I'm just going to have to be careful because it's my production environment. Um, like if you have a guest user, where would you go? This has always been, I will say this is something I've struggled with. Um, not just for guests, but also for internals. Uh, like even SharePoint, without a third-party tool, there isn't like a wide-ranging permission report to give a, a, a report of everything they have access to. Um, that's a good one, Andrew. You're supposed to... I emailed something out yesterday so you could prep me so I could prepare for these types of questions. Um, I mean, things to look out for is they will have access to some of it's going to be knowledge of Microsoft 365 too. They will have access to any of your org wide teams that you have set up. The other thing, especially with internal users to be aware of is if you have set up teams that are public or Microsoft 365 groups that are public, as soon as you add a user to your organization, they're able to go in and search for those teams and find those teams and join them themselves. Uh, so that is one thing, Andrew, that I would be aware of. And frankly, when I had some contractors start with me, I had to go through and flip a bunch of teams to private because I wanted those teams to remain private. Uh, yeah, this is a good one. Um, Andrew said he should have posted ahead of time, a topic for a future video or newsletter. Uh, it might be because you're really making me think now. I mean, you can go look through the audit log. Like one other thing you could do just to see. Huh, yeah, those public private teams will get you. Um, I mean, you could use the audit log to some extent. It's not going to show you what they have access to, but it would show you what they're going to. So I could go into my tenant and go in and find like my admin account and just run an audit log search on it and see huh, Andrew's going to lock teams down now. Um, you could go in and see like all those activities that they have. Uh, the one I was looking at with the, Oh, phone call. Apparently teams does. I didn't put teams on do not disturb. Um, there are access reviews in Entra. So if you go into Entra ID and run some access reviews, I do set up those sometimes to go cycle through and look at what people have access to. Uh, I am absolutely going to circle back on this one, Andrew. This is getting added to a newsletter because it it's kind of a variety of things. And I want to give a complete answer. And I'm struggling to come up with a complete answer on everything off the top of my head. Uh, Microsoft, the other area Microsoft will tell you to look is um, SharePoint Advanced Management. Uh, so if you go over to like um, <laughs> admin.microsoft.com, there I go. I'm going to keep. If somebody else has a question, uh, yeah, right. You can put Teams. It will. I don't know that I actually have Teams on Do Not Disturb because um, I'm not using Teams for this. <gasps> don't tell anybody. Uh, anyway, SharePoint, Advanced Management. This is something else Microsoft has rolled out recently is under Advanced Management, um, another place to go look would be uh, like your data access governance reports, some of your um, uh, site level access restrictions, recent actions. They're rolling out advanced management to help with uh, some of that essentially oversharing, people that have access to too much stuff. Um, so that's another area you could go look for uh, setting up some of that stuff 
is the advanced management. Unfortunately, it's another license. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, don't yell at me. I have no control over Microsoft licensing. I get frustrated by it too. Um, but it is another license to help with oversharing. Uh, I didn't really talk about guest users. Guest users, I don't tend to be as worried about because guest users don't get as much like org-wide ac org access by default. Um, they really usually only have exactly what you've given them access to. The hard part is, is finding a report on what they have access to. So future newsletter. I'm going to put a pin in this one for now. Uh, any other questions from anyone else in the chat about Microsoft 365 audit logs? I'm only seeing YouTube chats. I hope I should go look and see. Um, I popped up Twitter on another screen here to see if there's anything over there or people commenting. I don't see anything there. I don't know how to find the LinkedIn. If I click to join my own. Oh, I don't think I started this in. Did I mess up in LinkedIn? I may have not started this in LinkedIn like I was supposed to. That's kind of weird. LinkedIn says it's pre-live and I need to go in and start it, but I don't know how to start it in LinkedIn. I have to post something on LinkedIn to go watch this on YouTube after the fact. So that being said, any other questions from those of you watching on YouTube? Uh, if you are on Twitter, uh, you can send me a message on Twitter. I do have Twitter up or you can go find the live stream in LinkedIn. Um, or I can keep trying to think about Andrew's question if nobody else has any questions. Since I still have 20 minutes left. Another question. What are you most looking forward to with new stuff coming in Microsoft 365 admin or management? I... Here's one I want to learn more about. This is going to show me... All right, so that was a question from Andrew. Sorry. Um, what are you most looking forward to with new stuff coming in Microsoft 365 admin management? I, what I am most looking forward to that I need to wrap my head around the licensing of a little bit more uh, because I think it's going to be really expensive. Um, really expensive being relative. Really expensive for me being like four of us is actually some of the stuff that's coming with, don't laugh, with, it's a buzzword, with Copilot for security. Um, I spun this up for a little bit and then I spun it down because I got nervous that I was going to get charged a lot for it. Um, but it's starting to surface things where if you're in Intune, I think I'm safe to go to my landing page in Intune. Um, I spun it down so you can't get to it, but Copilot is starting to show up in things like Intune. And as you go through different compliance policies and configuration policies, it is going to, um, I think it's going to be a big help from a security perspective. Uh, KQL is, um, KQL is powerful, but if you can start asking Copilot questions in natural language and have it like parse through all your audit logs and all your security logs within Entra, look through all your stuff in Intune, uh, really look through all of your back end and do things like looking for anomalies for logins or returning instead of going to figure out a KQL query, just going in and asking Copilot to say, what are all of my, um, what are all the logins from this particular IP address over the last five days? Uh, and just have Copilot spit all of that information back to you. Be able to ask it information about users, about devices, about users and which devices they're logging into. Uh, I'm not a big, I'm still figuring out Copilot for creating content, but I really like Copilot for summarizing things. I like Copilot for summarizing meetings. But I think there's a lot of power with Copilot for security as that gets developed over the next however many months or years in terms of being able to summarize and return security information um, from you. So 
if I was to pick one, it's could end up being like around three thousand dollars a month. Um, I'll come back on the pricing once I have more time to play with it, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, so another question. T from T182. Planner always linked with a SharePoint site when it first came out. It looked fairly robust. Every plan it created seemed to make a SharePoint site. Uh, yes, that is still the case. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that changes um, as it kind of merges a little bit more with uh, Project, like with the whole Planner Premium being Project Plan 1. Reason being at this point in time, or when it came out, it still remains true today, is when you go to, I'm not going to go to Planner. When you go to Planner, Planner is has, still has a one-to-one -one relationship with a Microsoft 365 group. Um, and the reason for, um, and that's the reason you can't actually add Planner to a shared channel or a private channel in Teams is if you go into Teams and try to add Planner, you can't do it because private channels and uh, shared channels don't have a Microsoft 365 group associated with them, so you can't add a Planner plan to it. That's the whole reason why Planner plans create SharePoint sites is Planner plans need a, share, a Microsoft 365 group. A Microsoft 365 group creates a SharePoint site, so you end up in that boat with a SharePoint site for your Planner plan. Um, I think it is, uh, I don't really like it. I use it a lot or I'm starting to use it more and more now because in my business, I create a team and channels for all my different clients and projects. So I have SharePoint sites already for all those projects and all the work that I'm doing. So to add a planner plan to it isn't a big deal. I'm not going out and creating a bunch of planner plans where it's like, I don't need a SharePoint site with it. I actually tend to start with a SharePoint site and then add Planner to it. Um, again, so we'll see. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's any plans to change it, but it is still the fact for that it does create a SharePoint site. Uh, three things to my Microsoft 365 admin wish list for spring of 2024. Isn't that like done already? Um, or no, I guess it's winter. We're in Florida. There is no spring. It's all summer just different temperatures in the summer. Um, so next three things, we'll go with like next three things in uh, the next three months. I would like to see, goes back to my security for Copilot. I would love to see a little bit more clarity around pricing on that. Um, I would like to see it a little bit more. This is definitely a wish list. Uh, we're in fall spring, right? I had into a third winter. Um, you're not in Florida, Sean. Um, okay, Copilot. I would like to see Copilot for security more accessible for small businesses. Um, again, you look at somebody like me. There's me and a, a three contractors. Um, frankly, I cannot afford $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year for Copilot. I get it. A security incident would cost me a lot more. It's cheap. It's a cheap employee. It's cheaper than hiring a security employee, whatever. $36,000 is a lot for 5, 10, 15 person companies for security for Copilot. But in some respects, I feel like that would benefit. They would benefit the most from it. They don't have the ability to hire a full-time uh, security employee. They don't have the ability to spend a bunch of time usually with an IT department writing KQL queries and setting up all different alerts and investigating that. Um, being able to have like an IT admin guy that does it all, be able to leverage Copilot for security, I think would be a huge plus. I would love to see that. I don't know if that would come. Um, another wish list. Uh, man, wish lists, what would be number two or three B? Uh, Oh, uh, pass keys for Entra ID. I want pass keys to sign in. Like I can go add a hardware token right now and use it for like MFA with the fingerprint. But um, I saw so somebody posted something on April 1. It was 
not very nice. And I'm trying to decipher if it was an April Fool's joke or if it's slow rolling out where it was a picture of pass keys in Entry ID. So when you go into um, this one, I think I'm Entra doesn't have anything on the homepage. Like when you go into your Entra admin center and go to your authentication methods down here under where'd protection go? Protection, authentication methods. I want a pass key option in here to enable pass keys under my, um, where's my authentication methods now? Everything, it's like Entra didn't fully load. So you can go into Entra and configure your authentication methods. And these are authentication strengths, password protection. That's weird. It like disappeared on me. Um, I don't know what happened. So normally, let's try to reload the whole Entra portal. Identity, protection. I could go through Azure to get to this too. Show more. There it is. Those are... See, it's not there. There should be a list here that shows authentication methods where you can go turn on like, do you want to allow SMS? Do you want to allow uh, OAuth hardware? Do you want to go in and allow uh, password lists? Do you want to allow uh, FIDO2 tokens? Um, I saw someone post one with pass keys in there where you could go and enable pass keys. So you could do like pass keys with the iPhone or pass keys. One password now supports pass keys. I want pass keys for my intro login experience. Um, that would be number two. Uh, number three for my wish list would be um, I don't know of a number three. You're making me think of what do I want? I'm trying to decipher too what um, yeah, I don't have a third one right now. I want pass keys and I want copilot to be more accessible to small and medium sized businesses. Um, one other thing, I know Lighthouse does this some. Um, this would maybe be another wish list. This is no way it would come in the next three months. Um, I work with a lot of customers. Like it would also be nice if it would, it kind of relates to Copilot. It kind of relates to just security in general. For small businesses that I manage, some of them have like enterprise plans. They're still doing E3 and E5 for the security. Um, if I had some way where I can more easily like set up security alerts across all of the different organizations or clients that I support, again, especially small and medium sized businesses, Lighthouse does this to some effect, some respect, but I think Lighthouse is still tied to business uh, standard premium and I guess basic, still tied to the business SKUs. If I could do Lighthouse with the enterprise SKUs or get like, create like a security dashboard. So if I have five clients I'm managing and I'm doing administrative work for, I could go in and like use Copilot for all of our organizations, or I could um, like set up some type of security monitoring alerting so I could help them with their security. Uh, that would be a huge challenge because of not letting data um, uh, come across between the different tenants. Um, like, how do you license Copilot when it's crawling all that data? But it would be interesting to see if there's a way to do better security management across a bunch of organizations. There you go. Three items off the top of my head. I'm sure as soon as I'm done, I'll think of like four or five more. Um, so those, okay, good. Andrew clarified no time frame. Good. Cause a lot of those are not, I don't think those are small lifts to go put in place. Uh, so I see lots of comments from T182, Sean, Andrew, any other comments? It looks like there's 20 people or so watching. Anybody else have any questions, comments, thoughts? Um, anything else? Anything else you want me to see? Anything else you want me to go click on and play with? Ooh, I have another wish list item. I thought of another one. Uh, 
I want to see there's still some gaps when it comes to Entra, ID, Microsoft Entra joined devices, or even um, some of the things around enrolling. This is one I've struggled with. Enrolling devices into Intune that have already be, have been joined to uh, Entra ID. So one struggle I've had, I've actually had several clients rolling at Intune lately. Um, and you can auto-enroll devices in Intune via a group policy, an active directory, or you can auto-enroll them when they first join, uh, when they're first joined to Microsoft Entra, formerly known as Azure AD. Uh, however, if you have devices that you have enrolled into Entra ID already or joined into Entra ID already, but you didn't have the auto enrollment to Intune set up, or maybe you didn't even have Intune licensing, there is not a automated way to go in and like bulk enroll these devices. You can use, like you can do some things with provisioning package, uh, but a provisioning package, you have to push out through a deployment mechanism, uh, Intune, but if you're not registered to Intune, it's like the whole chicken and egg. You can't push it out with Intune because you're not registered to Intune and you need to push it out in order to register to Intune. You could use something else. If you're using SCCM or another deployment tool, you can push it out. Um, you can go remote in devices and manually run the provisioning package. I've also had people like send their provisioning package to all the end users um, and say, go run this provisioning package to enroll yourself in Intune. Uh, I want to see some easy way to somehow enroll all these devices in Intune uh, if they're already joined to Enter ID. Again, not an easy problem to solve because unlike a domain controller, you don't really have rights over them. They're joined to Entra, but they're not registered, so you don't have the hooks into it that you need to like go deploy stuff. Um, which is what Intune needs. I don't know if you could somehow do it via autopilot, like you if you enroll the device in autopilot and on some type of a reboot, uh, it could go out and recognize that it's an autopilot and pull something down. Um, and it's like it's it's just clunky. I want a better way to bulk and roll already enjoyed Entra Entra ID devices into Intune would be another wish list item. Oh, Sean says it's letting him add a pass key, kind of. It's failing at giving it a name. So I did go in and flip a setting um, in my tenant today that I think might be pass keys. I think it was like OAuth hardware device or something. Um, but it hasn't lit up that I have seen for me yet. So maybe I'll have to go look and see if I can add a pass key as well. Uh, so now you got four wish list items for me. Uh, easier way to bulk and roll and try to join devices into Intune. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? We got like four minutes left. And then it's noon for me and I'm getting hungry. Uh, so it wasn't April Fool's. Pass keys are coming. We just don't know when and it looks like it's still in preview. All right. I'll give you a couple more minutes. And then sign off because I know YouTube is behind me too. Just don't know how long. All right. Well, if nobody has any more questions, uh, thank you all for joining today. Hopefully all of you found it useful. Um, if you are interested in the newsletter, feel free to go sign up for the new newsletter. Uh, if you're interested in working with me more to become the go-to Microsoft 365 expert in your organization, uh, there will be information about that in my newsletter as well. Or there is the link I provided earlier, and I will drop all those here in the chat a minute. Oh, and of course it puts them all in one line. Well, I think that'll work. I think you can still click on all of those. They're just all in a single line. Uh, so yeah, you're welcome. Look for more of these. I will continue to put these in the newsletter too. Again, my goal is to do it once a month. Um, and I did at this time, I'll probably do it in the future too, is send out an email a day or two before 
So if you have any questions you want to pre-submit so I can prepare for them, um, or if you're thinking of them, uh, let me know. But for now, thanks again. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and enjoys 